the top. Um, Stephen McConaughey leads the BFI's data and digital preservation department with strategic and operational responsibility for the BFI National Archives data and digital preservation policies, standards, practices, and infrastructure. Uh, BFI's creation of a national filmography of feature films, uh, a data set of all feature length films identified as British since the start of cinema with a full cast and crew raised some questions that could not be answered using traditional research methods. Uh, questions such as how many women have directed British feature films? Are career prospects for women in the British film industry improving? In today's talk, the BFI on weaponizing filmography, uh, Stephen will just discuss these questions, their answers, and much more. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that we are going to record the session for the ODI YouTube channel. If you could please mute your mic and video until after Stephen has presented and to submit any questions via the chat function. Also, if you'll be tweeting about today's event, please tweet using the hashtag ODI Fridays. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm happy to introduce Stephen McConaughey of the BFI. Take it away, Steve. Thank you. Thanks to ODI for inviting me to present. I'm going to share my screen. Um, here we go. And okay. So just briefly, the, the BFI is the lead body for film in the United Kingdom. We run the, the BFI National Archive, which is the, the National Archive for the Moving Image, Film and Television. Um, and we run lots of data projects and processes, both for the collections and independently of the collections, like this one I'm going to describe to you. So I'll crack on. So I like to use this quote. It's probably a very well-known, familiar quote, maybe overused. Um, I think it's quite appropriate for 2020, but essentially we talk a lot about film. We talk a lot about the industry and the art form. And about five years ago, we hatched a plan to create a, a database for the national, the British feature film. Um, and the, one of the reasons for that is we felt it was important to have an, an evidence-based, data-driven, to discuss things like career prospects and the national collection and the industry in terms of diversity and inclusion. So that was the driver for the project. I won't um, tell you where this quote's from. There's a very strong visual clue but the answer is later in the presentation, in case the clue is not strong enough. Um, so what is the BFI filmography? So the, the inclusion criteria are, uh, are here. British. So sounds straightforward, but what is British? So we, by British, what we mean in this context is one or more of the production companies that created the film is registered at company's house, or the film meets the cultural test for Britishness, which is um, the cultural test is run by the BFI and it, it gives um, points for various things like the nationality of the director and actors and so on. So British, second feature length, 40 minutes or longer is our criteria for feature length. That's quite a commonly used one. The Oscars, for example, use 40 minutes or longer. Um, so only 40 minute long films are in scope for this data set. And finally, cinema release. Um, this, is, this will be increasingly difficult to justify, I suspect, this category as we go forward. But for the, for the, the history of the film viewing, this has been a, a reasonably easy to defend criteria. So if a film meets those requirements, it's in the filmography. So where did we get the data from? I'm often asked. So since 1934, the BFI has fulfilled a, a document of record function for every feature film released in the UK. And that was achieved through the publication of the monthly film bulletin till 91 and then Sight and Sound from 91 onwards. Um, that created a record either in card or paper and increasingly in databases for every feature film. Prior to 34, we have the great Dennis Gifford British Film Catalogue Fiction Film Volume. This is, um, in some people's opinion, the greatest book ever written about film, um, especially catalogers would say that. It's an incredible labour of love by the author. Um, and that really filled up our understanding prior to 1934. So all of those records made it into what we call the Collections Information Database, which is the BFI's kind of master database of films um, 
And really that comprises a data set for the British feature film. So I'm often asked this next, how many films are in it? We really had no idea how many would be in it until we completed the project, but the answer is currently, as of I think Friday, 10,675. It was just around 10,000 when we launched this project in 2017. And you can see they're broken down by decade, which decades are the most and least productive in terms of British feature film production. And 2010s was the most productive decade ever, um, beaten by the 30s before that. But, uh, we found that very interesting. Um, Eagle-eyed among you who know that the first films were made in 1895 will say, hang on a second, what's this 1910s business? What about 1895 to 1910? So remember 40 minutes or greater is our, one of our three criteria for inclusion. And the first 40 minute feature film was made in 1911. And here it is, um, Rob Roy McGregor, in 1715, an outlawed clan leader leads a rebellion against George I. It's a Scottish produced film, was the first British feature film. And you can see in the work history there, it says the first British three reel feature. So um, unfortunately, we don't have it in the collection. I would love it to turn up, but not so far. So once we had made the data set, and this, I have to emphasize this was a five year project to create the data set from those sources and a team of dedicated catalogers to input the data and perfect it. So we started asking questions. What kind of questions can this data set answer? And we started with some fun questions. What are the most common words in the titles? And we made a obligatory tag cloud. Who can resist the tag cloud? Um, this already points you towards gender as a consideration in film data. So, and this works like a little poem about gender in film, man, love, nightlife, girl, London house, woman, lady, men, mister. So we were excited by these fun questions and we asked some more, who are the most featured characters in the British feature film? And here's the answer. Queen Victoria and James Bond tied and Sherlock competing for third place. Um, and there's, of course, the answer to the quote question at the first slide. It's a quote from one of the uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes books. Um, so interestingly, Victoria and Holmes share screen time in at least two of the films in the data set. Um, one, a pretty good film by all accounts, and one, a not so good film by all accounts. but. I say at least two because although we have the entities for the actors, we know that Robert Stevens is a person who was in many films, same with Will Ferrell. We don't have entities for the characters. So they're really just text strings. Sherlock Holmes is a text string in our database. So if the character is not called Sherlock Holmes, if they're called Jimmy Holmes or Sherlock Holmey or whatever else, then we won't find them. So one of the unsolved ambitions in the data set is to create entities for characters so that we can track them even if they have different names. That is something I would like to pursue. So then we started asking less trivial questions about perhaps industry and career. And the first thing we asked, because we're a very director focused organization sometimes, is how many people have directed these films? And there was the answer. I should emphasize some of these statistics are perhaps a year and a half out of date because we haven't refreshed the analysis for a while. So if you go to our application after this and you find a different result, um, that's why. So we then asked some questions about how many films do people get to direct in their careers? And we found out, we started to find out some interesting things about career. 62% of those made only one British feature film and only 6% of those people got to make 10 or more. Now it's important to say they may have directed television, they may have gone on to direct adverts or video games or theatre, etc. But this was quite interesting because it starts to show you how a data set like this can let you ask unaskable questions about career prospects and industry. And then we thought about this question. In fact, I remember the day a colleague asked me this question. That's all very well, Stephen, but how many of those directors are women? And that led us to this position. 
what questions can't the filmography answer and what can or might we be able to do about that? So the rest of this presentation really is about zooming in on that, that on, on the journey we went through from that question, how many women are in those directors? So I'm going to describe what we did about it. So the first thing we did is we, we started to develop methodologies for how you might genderize at scale. And that took us to the ONS baby names data set. They've been publishing genders of baby naming for many years now. It's a very rich data set. It has its flaws, which I'll describe, but it's nonetheless very rich. So we started to think, could we use this? So this is an example on the left of our data set of persons. And on the right, the XML, try and make it a rule to get some XML or JSON into every presentation on this subject. Um, so we started to do this, to experiment with this idea. Could you infer gender? And it's important to say you're inferring it. You have no knowledge if it's true or not. You're, you're making an inference. Could we infer gender based on phone name match? So Arthur is only in the male ONS data set. Olivia is only in the female ONS data set and Oliver. So we found out that was surprisingly successful. And by successful, I mean the yield of matches was surprisingly high. So what we did is we went ahead and ran our data set through that. We made some code in Python and we ground through the data. And what we've achieved is all with a star, persons in the National Film Database have been ground through that genderizing uh, meat grinder. Um, and we've genderized the name of around 1.2 million from the history of cinema in our database. Now there, there are some caveats. So 42,000 don't have four names. So they're either one name persons or they have initials. We have a lot of initials, especially in the early years of cinema. So J Smith or F um, Franks or whatever. Now you can't genderize an initial using four names, so there's a data set problem. Um, 220,000 have names outside the data set, and that's largely because the data set is skewed to traditional English names. Um, so obvious areas are excluded. Um, and 130,000 have names that are difficult or impossible to infer, Jan, Kim, George, because they appear in both the male and the female ONS names data set. So here's what we did not do yet. We did not infer gender for the names that were neutral based on probability. So we know George is more likely to be male than female, but we did not make a method to say George equals male, probably, not yet. We didn't find any data sets yet for non-English origin names, South Asian, East Asian, Middle Eastern, lots of those in the, in the data set, but we don't have a solution yet. We didn't yet develop a self-declaration methodology. So I can tell the BFI if I'm male or female. And probably most critically, we did not yet develop a model for non-binary gender categories, transgender, intersex, and so on. It's impossible to make inference about those um, fluid and dynamic categories. So it would be very, I think, unwise to even try inference. I think only self-declaration would achieve that. So those are gaps in our methodology. That said, with a margin of error and with all the caveats I've described, we now can answer questions like this. 9% of all the directors in this filmography so far are women. And that means you can start to ask really perhaps interesting and useful questions about career. The average number of features a man gets to direct, 3.4 compared with 1.5. So already you can start to see how this is an evidence based for assertions about uh, gender balance and equality and career prospects. Um, so what happened next? Next, we engaged some help and we, we went into a really, really excellent, profound collaboration with Nesta. You can Google Nesta if you've never come across them, but they're an absolutely amazing organization. They do hugely innovative and exciting work in data analysis and visualization. Um, 
and that's a great infographic about their history. We work with Kath Sleeman, who's the head of data visualization at Nesta, and I sh I, it's impossible to emphasize the impact of Kath's work on this project. And the vast majority of what I'm going to show from here on has Kath's um, talent and determination across it. If you ever get a chance to work with Nesta and Kath in particular, I recommend you take that opportunity with both hands. So Nesta helped us do some really deep analysis of the data set. And one of the, I'm going to talk you through a few of the findings. One of the things we found is average career length and number of films started with quite a difference in the 20s, 30s and 40s. But by the 2000s, it had evened out to an extent. So what we kind of concluded was that the differences in longevity and numbers have almost narrowed to equality. But there's lots of areas where gender plays out very differently in the data set. And I'll talk you through a few of those. So unnamed roles. In other words, there's a role in a script called prostitute. 94% of those go to women. Drunks, 5%. Photographers, 3%. Reporters, a bit more equally represented. But from this, we thought with Nesta, wouldn't it be interesting to examine some of the roles where we have workforce, population workforce data for how it is now? So we started with doctors and the general practitioner register tells us that fifty two percent of the UK doctors workforce are women. In pre nineteen eighty five, three percent of those roles went to women. By eighty five it was up to an incredible fifteen percent. So again you can start to tease out comparisons between film gender processes and population indexing um, and you can yield some quite interesting discoveries. Um, Nesta helped us analyse the gender balance of cast across the whole data set, 32. As late as 2017 it had gone down from the average and the UK workforce is 47%. So feature films made in Britain or British feature films rather are under indexing massively for women in the cast against the workforce. Um, it also now lets us examine key roles in the filmmaking um, ecosystem. And what you can learn is that the director of photography, only 6% of those are women, and 5% for the composer, and 6% for the, the lead in the sound department. Now, later on, I'll show a cross-section of all the departments. But again, this data set lets us now ask hard questions about opportunities for women in filmmaking in British feature films um, and we went deep into this question because it, it aligned with Nesta's agenda for career data analysis so here you can see the same for the crew as we did for the cast started very low in in the early years of cinema and then 16 percent is the average across the data set 34 percent in recent years but again the workforce is 47 percent so I mean, there's lots of um, hypotheses you can make to why it under indexes. Partly it's because the film industry has a freelance model. Partly there's, so the impacts on, for example, women leaving uh, work to have children and returning to work is a, is a major consideration and factor. Um, flexible working hours and long working hours on a film set are no other factors. Um, so this was a very interesting area of analysis. We, we, we examined cases where uh, there was a, a male writer and director or multiple writers and directors, so only men in those roles, yielded 28% female crew. When there was only f women as writers and directors on a film, the average leapt to 36% for crew. I should say there's margins of error, quite substantial margins of error, because we don't have complete genderization of all crew. Nonetheless, you could start to speculate that where you, where you give women the predominant decision-making roles in the feature film, writer and director and so on, um, the impact is substantial for the opportunities for women across the whole film crew and cast. Um, there's more analysis needed to tease out causality 
these are correlations and we don't necessarily want to say there's a direct causation between the two things, but it's tempting to make those um, causality joins. So I've got a link at the end of the presentation that will take you to the Nesta analysis, but I really recommend if you're interested in this area to have a look at the Nesta work because it's really incredibly nuanced and detailed and um, much more nuanced and detailed than I'm presenting it here. And I'll just give you a few kind of examples of their data visualization. They broke it down by genre to understand cast and crew. What are the, what are the influences of genre on the, the gender balance and cast and crew? Very interesting analysis, which yields some, some surprises, but some not surprises, I guess. Um, but very detailed work, so I recommend you to take a look at that. Um, again, deep analysis into what does it mean for various roles if the, the key crew members, production, writing, direction, are women compared with when those roles are men. Um, and this is very interesting. It, it is analysis of unnamed roles. So when the script or the casting, for example, is for a, you know, a teacher or a clerk or a magistrate or a journalist, how often do those roles go to women and how often do they go to men? Because in theory, those roles can go to either gender. Um, so on the top right, you can see the hugely indexing for women. So prostitute, housekeeper, nurse, secretary, receptionist, cook, neighbor, dancer, shop assistant. And the bottom left, hugely indexing for men, police sergeant, police inspector, postman, colonel, doorman, etc. And then swimming around the middle, you have a whole bunch of roles where it's slightly more equal and balanced teacher, student, customer, reporter. So as I said, there's lots more detail on the Nesta analysis and there's a link at the end of the presentation, but it, it's fascinating to me. Um, and I, we'll have to assess this again in 10 years to see what has changed, if anything. Uh, and it breaks down with small multiples in this terms, each of the departments and how gender balance plays out. Um, and I'll, I'll visualize that in a second. Um, we were really interested in this area, which departments have changed and improved in terms of offering roles to women. And one of the fascinating things about this timeline analysis is you can see around the time of the Second World War, how there's several trends, I think. The Second World War clearly, in all walks of British life, offered opportunities for women to take on roles that might have typically or traditionally gone to men. And, and you can see those spikes in the film production roles also. The same is true in the 80s. We see this across the whole data set in almost every context. Women got to take more roles in filmmaking across the board, but in key roles from, from the 80s and those are around upwards. Um, you can see the population index is the red dotted line. So only a few key roles get to make it above the population index in offering opportunities for women. And some are massively below. And um, here's a general index of the departments. Um, the technical departments, you might call them, photography, sound, special effects, yield least opportunities for women. But fascinatingly to me, writing, um, I would have predicted women would have much higher opportunity in terms of writing because by definition you don't necessarily need to be on a film set, you don't necessarily need to be attributed with any of those things that traditionally have been attributed to men that might justify it, like we often heard you had to lift heavy camera equipment therefore the roles went to men. All of that justification is not really present for writing and yet 12.5%. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, makeup, casting, costumes, choreography offer more opportunities. Very few of them offer more than population index in terms of roles for women. So some bullet points. Um, cast balance has not improved substantially from the 70s and there might be evidence that it's backslide. Um, crew has improved substantially, but the gains slowed in the 90s. Um, we see stereotyping, stereotyping by gender at film and character level. Um, the most prolific women still are contributing to fewer films than prolific male counterparts. 
Um, when women are in senior writing and directing roles, women get more jobs on the film, but there's few of those cases. And uh, the length of women's careers has risen and the gender gap in numbers may be closing also. Gender balance is not equal across departments and those I've listed there are the least balanced photography, sound, special effects and writing. So what did we do next? We did quite a lot in 2017 and 18 to, to make use of this data. We published some infographics, for example, No Place for a Lady, which was shared on social media and got quite a lot of um, traction. Uh, but most importantly, we made a web application and I'll, I'll share a link at the end, as I said. That web application allows you to go into the data by three uh, avenues films, roles and people and it lets you ask questions and see data visualizations as a result and share those. For example, you can see the most prolific actresses, directors, writers by gender or not by gender, by decade or not by decade and share the results. Um, so it's a, it's a very big data driven web application and we were nominated, we were in the shortlist actually for the Kantar Information is Beautiful Awards, I think quite win it, but never mind. Um, so just to round this up, this is a quote from Luke McKernan, who's the curator of Moving Image at the British Library. And he wrote a great blog, which I quote liberally, because I love it and it gave me my title, The BFI Filmography Weaponizes Film Data. The key passage is that um, filmographies serve purposes of their times. They're not neutral artifacts. We create them for purposes sales tools originally in early cinema and now we have used this filmography to challenge what is privileged and what is suppressed so in other words film data if we if we if we tackle it at volume and we ask hard questions i think can surface things that we suspect are true but that we now can use data to defend and justify and in this context what we're surfacing is the the opportunities and the roles and the position of women within British feature filmmaking. But I'm sure there's masses of other stories in this data set that can be surfaced. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I made some links, so I can put these in the chat or you can, I guess, take a photo or I made some Bitly links to make them shorter. There's one which gives you a great overview of the, the whole project and the data set and the pros and cons and also links to the web application. And then there's Kath Sleeman's DataViz, which I strongly recommend you take a look at. Um, and then Luke's blog, if you want to, to read up on that, and Luke puts it in the context of other filmographies through the ages, including Dennis Gifford's great uh, British film catalogue. So I guess I will stop sharing my screen and I can take any questions that anyone has. Great, thanks so much, uh, Stephen. That was a really, <clears throat> really illuminating talk. Um, so we'll go to Q and A now, um, and uh, I will. Uh, I'll I'll call up the the names, uh, and and people can sort of um, unmute themselves and, and show their video and ask them themselves. But if they don't want to, um, yeah, by by all means, I can uh, read them out for you. Uh, I'll ask the first one myself, uh, although there's a couple there um, to to get the ball rolling. So. Um, we noticed that in the genderization of the BFI filmography, um, there was obviously a focus on, on women and men and sort of the contrast there. Uh, you, you, you mentioned briefly that um, other sort of genders and gender fluidity was not properly uh, or not fully acknowledged because of the inferring uh, techniques and a more self-declarative uh, process might be needed for that. Are there, are there plans to sort of go forward with looking at um, what wider gender inclusion uh, into this? Right, so uh, through the project we were often asked that question, we asked ourselves that question, what do we do about this challenge? And then um, we did look into the potential for some degree of inference or automation and it's just impossible. Um, I think it, everyone would, would agree it's categorically impossible to use forename, for example, to infer fluid gender. Um, and fundamentally, I think where we are, where we arrived is probably not controversial. But I think where we arrived is that the only robust way to really tackle that problem is through self-declaration. 
and other data projects are trying to achieve self-declaration for diversity characteristics. The, the, the big example is Project Diamond in the television world, where there's a, there's a project for self-declaration by everyone who produces a television program in the cast and crew to self-declare all of the, their diversity properties, age, sexuality, gender, um, class background, disability, and so on. Um, and I, I think in the project team, we felt that it, in order to tackle it, we could not automate any mass inference or assertion of that. And I think really the only way to solve it ultimately is through developing a, a self-declaration model, which is certainly an ambition, but is very hard to achieve. Um, project Diamond, I think, has proven how difficult it can be to make such a project work very well. Um, but it is in our ambition to try and tackle that problem. I just don't have an easy, fast solution for it. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll go to the, um, the chat now. I see Mitchell Adu has asked a question. Mitchell, would you like to ask your question um, in person or would you rather me uh, read it out for you? Uh, I, I can say in person. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Mitchell. Hi. Uh, what do you think it was about the 80s that inspired the boom in opportunities for women? So we discussed that at length, as you can imagine, because when you see those ramps in the visualization, it's very provocative to think there must be there must be an explanation. Causality, I think it's one of the things we found in the project is correlation is not enough for our brains. We can't sit still if we see a trend and know that there's a cor correlation. We have to understand cause. What caused this? What was behind it? And we did that again and again and again. Um, and we discussed the 80s ramp extensively and we speculated and theorized. And one of the theories was Thatcherism. Um, Thatcherism had such a, you know, such an impact on British professional life uh, that we speculated some of the interventions by the Thatcher's, Thatcherite project in, in, in unionization may have impacted on opportunities for women. Now I have to emphasize, I haven't, I'm not a historian and we haven't engaged with any historians to really deeply explore this. But we speculated that the impacts of um, the Thatcherite agenda on changing the way unions worked in British um, filmmaking may have had an interesting impact on opportunities for women. Um, not to say that the unionised workforce was preventing women from getting jobs, but we speculate that that might be worth exploring, that the changing landscape for the film unions may have open gates for women, not sure. And of course, I guess you could say Thatcherism in general may have anecdotally had an impact on, on women feeling empowered to take traditionally male jobs. I'm, these are speculations. As I said, we haven't engaged with film historians to assess it, but um, there's certainly a ramp in the 80s for women in roles that seem to be either unavailable to them, unattractive to them, whatever that reason was prior to the 80s. But I, I always emphasize to my colleagues during the project that what we're seeing is correlation. And you can speculate to causation, but until you've done the legwork to understand the factors, you really should hesitate, if, hesitate and probably don't make clear correlation, sorry, don't make clear causation assertions because it's, it's complex and there could be many, many factors that we haven't considered and so on. So I'm quite cautious of it saying it was because of this. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that, that's really interesting and very interesting correlations as well, even if they, they don't uh, prove uh, causality. Um, sure. something, certainly something to be said you know, when, when uh, women and, and other people from uh, historically disadvantaged groups are able to achieve sort of um, high profile um, jobs and stuff like that. And people always say, well, you know, once one person does it, it can inspire others. And now it may also inspire others in, in, in different walks of life as well. Um, right, and there's a great, um, there's lots of data projects um, to analyze the opportunities for women in, in films that do things like, if I can see it, I can be it, is one of the common kind of yeah. 
messages that if women see people performing those roles, then they're, you know, if you're a, if you're a 10 year old girl and you have no idea that women can be in, you know, the director of photography in a feature film, it will never cross your radar that that's a career prospect for you. So there might be like a availability um, shift. If, if women see women doing work, then they become aware that they can do that work. But as I said, it's total speculation on my part. I'd love to engage with film historians with this data um, and hopefully we will do that ultimately. Great. Uh, going back to the chat, I see the ODI's own Hannah Folds has a question. And would you like to ask that out loud? Hi, hi, Stephen. Um, yeah, sorry, getting in there from the ODI. Um, I'm, I'm curious about whether um, bringing in data sets from elsewhere, other sources, um, could help tell the stories that you want to, to unearth or can help bring new perspectives or insights to your archive? And, and if so, which ones? Yeah, so in terms of gender, one of the things we always have in our ambition is to, so, so not all the films are available in this data set. It's, it's impossible for us to get access to all of the films themselves because in early cinema in particular, lots of the films are lost, uh, missing, believed, lost. Um, so, but that said, a lot of the later period films are available and it's always been one of our ambitions to create a data set of moving image and audio in order to use computer vision to do some and speech to text to do some analysis of things like um, screen time for women in these films and also speech time. Speech time and speech content has been a big area for this type of analysis. Um, and there was a great piece by The Pudding, I think, um, who looked at Disney films and looked at even those Disney films where women get to be in prominent roles or are animated into prominent roles. And they, they looked at the speech content for those women. And they, there's some amazing insights that even if women are in the prominent roles in the Disney animations, most of the time they're speaking in response to men. So there's loads of analysis you can do with speech to text and like sentiment analysis and entity recognition and, and computer vision. But first you have to gather that corpus of, of audiovisual data. Um, so that's one area. Other areas are things like uh, population data and workforce data. We haven't done masses of uh, cross-referencing with population data and workforce data. Um, I'd quite like to do some of that work and compare the film industry through time with other industries through time. To, to see if film making has been particularly uh, equal or particularly unequal and unbalanced. In com in, in, and I'd love to see if those trends and workforce changes map to other industries or other sectors. Um, so I'm really interested in those questions. How does our, how does our timeline map against timelines in equivalent or not equivalent industries? But I don't know how much data there is for historical trends in other industries, but I'd love to examine that if I had a thousand dollars every day. Absolutely. The, the, the speech component um, is really interesting too. I wonder um, if there could be an analysis done on you know, how many in, uh, films in the BFI passed the, the Bechtel test or something like that. Uh, right, I think that yeah. would be an interesting experiment as well. Yes, the Bechtel test, for those who don't know, is a really great classic um, I had a slide on it actually and I took it out for time, but the Bechdel test says a film passes the Bechdel test if there, let me see if I get this straight, if there is at least one scene with two women uh, who are not talking about a man. Is that true to say? That's the nature I think, of it. I think that's it. It might be slightly badly worded, but it's a fascinating idea and I'd love to, to undertake that analysis, but it's difficult, women must be named too, thank you Jay. Um, it's very difficult to achieve that because a lot of the films are lost. So in a lot of the films cases for huge swathes of this data set, we'll never be able to see the film. So all we have is the synopsis, which might give us a clue, but it's not gonna yield that much detail. So, but we could tackle it for the recent decades where the films are available, and that would be an amazing project, but labor intensive. Um, mm -hmm. Until machine learning is at such a point where I can just, you know, type in my question and fire 
three thousand films across the machine learning, and it will give me, you know, a nice visualization. Maybe it is already there. I don't know. Right. Um, so yeah, going back to the chat, I see uh, Luke McKernan has a question. Luke, would you like to ask your question? Well, uh, hi, Stephen. Uh, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I, I was j j just want I mean, you'll, you'll be aware, of course, you know, the, the data that you used has come, it's changed over time. You used to get <clears throat> you know, very detailed credits now, not nearly so, so much in the past. So it, it is, there's limitations to how much you, we, we can compare one with the other. Yes. Just looking at now whether you've got the data that's really useful for you, and whether something might come out of this might actually say we want films to be described in a different way by sight and sound or whatever, which will help uh, not only uh, film, film graphic analysis but uh, a deeper understanding of how the industry is developing. Do you think? Yes, definitely, absolutely critical question. What we learned through doing this data project is that the way we've catalogued the films through the decades has been for like your blog point about shifting purposes and reasons and drivers and context and what's been missing I mean we've used the data to unpack some diversity and inclusion um, understandings but that was never anyone's intention in creating the data you know that was never in anyone's mind until probably the last 10 years realistically so one of the things we've learned is that if we want to understand our our, our sector and our film culture and our archive in terms of in, inclusion and diversity in other words how does the industry and the archive both reflect its population um, First of all, does it? In what ways is it doing well in that? In, in what ways is it doing poorly? We really need to start documenting with that in mind. And so we've started work on that from the time we got to the end of this project. We've been developing um, data models to let us capture many areas of diversity um, through through either inference or first-hand knowledge. But some specifics, we're, we're now really interested in why we collect for the National Archive for diversity and inclusion reasoning. In other words, when we collect for the collection, uh, we're now starting to document those contexts. And I think that's really important because the, the archive has to, obviously has to reflect the population of our, of our country and our culture. So we have definitely shifted and started to think much harder about what data we're creating and for what purposes. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's absolutely critical and I think we're just scratching the surface of it because historically we've catalogued to enable search and disambiguation and you know understanding on a very kind of um, straightforward level. But I think we're realizing now that the documentation has to deliver much more complex requirements that may even not be straightforward, that may not be straightforward now, but may be absolutely critical in 10 years or 20 years. So it's taught us to think much harder about what data we create and for what purposes. And we have started, especially in diversity and inclusion areas, but I don't think we're done there. I think we have to keep thinking much harder. Um, and a good example of some of the impacts is we now extract subtitles from our off-air television recording and turn that subtitling into searchable metadata so therefore we now are able to we haven't done much with it yet but we're now able to search all of the speech that is on our television corpus for things like entities and in theory um, mood and sentiment and so on and so forth so in 10 years we might be able to look back at the television corpus in particular and say um, how did people talk about coronavirus for that for in 2020 on television um, so yeah it's a critical area and we need to get much better at it as a as teams of catalogers and as a an industry for documenting our collections i think yeah okay thank you Great, thanks um, and Denise has a question. Denise, would you like to um, unmute your mic and ask the question? 
Um, yes, happy to. And it builds on what you were saying, Stephen. Thank you for your presentation, which is really about the why and the what you do with the data. Right. So um, I was just curious, although there are two questions there, I think, you know, it's summed up pretty much in the, well, what next and, and, and why? So um, since we launched that filmography project, we have done several follow on projects, which I left out of the the presentation for time but our first major follow-on project was around ethnicity um in 20 i think it was 2018 maybe 2017 late or 2018 early the bfi had a major cultural program event called black star and that was really about foregro foregrounding the role of black actors in the feature film and there was a huge south bank season with lots of events, seminars and symposia and so on. And we we undertook, a, I think it was a two year project to to go through the a 10 year sample of British feature films and to infer ethnicity for black actors. We tried to identify all the black actors in a 10 year um, data set. And we, we published the findings. Um, and in that link that I, I put on the last slide, if you go to that area on the BFI website, you can read that Black Star um, research publication. And we found quite a lot of things for, for black actors that were both revealing and uh, interesting and shocking, but also predictable in some ways. But at least it was data driven uh, understanding rather than, uh, rather than speculation. So we did that for black actors in a 10 year data set. And the thing we're currently doing is um, we broadened the scope of the ethnicity, so we're dealing with all ethnicity categories from the UK census. So that's obviously the Office of, for National Statistics, uh, UK, actually, England and Wales population census categories. But because the broadening of the scope means it's much more work, we had to narrow the, the data set. So we're looking at a four year sample of the BFI's top 20 British um, qualifying films and um, independent films and we're trying to infer the ethnicity of all the actors in all those films it's close to 150 films and what we're hoping to do is publish our findings on a broader ethnicity analysis about opportunities for actors in those films um, of course you have to be very careful with inferring ethnicity and um, it's obviously fraught with peril if you're casual about such a task. So we, we're trying to be as robust as you can be in making the inference. And unless we can find very, very high quality source for that inference, we're stopping short of it. So there's a much higher uh, proportion of unknown. Uh, so then that leads you into statistical challenges, such as how do you deal with a huge uh, gap in your inference so so those are the two major projects that we've done what we did next was uh, black actors in the data set of 10 years and the ethnicity of all actors in a, in a much smaller data set i don't know when we'll publish the findings for that it may be next year but um i guess look out for that from the bfi is some kind of publication of findings great thanks for that i think there's one more question in um Oh, I see that Jay has just asked a question. Jay, would you like to um, say that out loud? I would love to. Um, I did repeat myself a bit in that asking, but essentially I'm thinking that um, a lot of different actors, not actual actors, but uh, people in this industry could use this kind of data to do things like um, kind of gamify, like best performing film or something like that, particularly if they're, if they're trying to um, certainly get a big return on, on what they've produced uh, while also kind of fulfilling certain requirements and criteria for, for well-performing films. Do you, right. you foresee that kind of thing happening, kind of a shift in the norms of the industry in that way? I definitely do, and we see that already. Um, if you go to our web application, we did have a, a visualization about box office takings, and it would be it was possible in our application to filter on gender, you know, how many films show me all the films with a female director, writer, producer, fifty percent cast, and show me the box office implications. Unfortunately, we had to remove the box office because a lack of data after I think 2012 perhaps. Um, but what we've seen since we've completed this project is engagement from some of the production context and rights holders, and um, specifically some of the studios 
who have engaged with us in discussions of exactly that kind, how can we build understandings of, if we shift the sliders for diversity of on-screen and narrative and off-screen, what does that mean for the impact and revenue, sorry, impact and profitability and so on of the films? Um, and I know, I know from the TV industry, which we're also engaged with because we're the lead body for film, but we run the National Television Archive. Television is all over this question and film production is getting to be all over it. Is if you shift the sliders for diversity of on-screen representation, the audiences, the impact for audience is huge. And, and Netflix and people like that are acutely aware of this, is audiences want to see themselves. I think I'm speculating again, but why not? Um, audiences want to see themselves in, in the narratives and in the representation. And if you make your representation rich and diverse and not stereotypical and not limited, then the audience implications are huge. And a lot of the UK TV public service broadcasters I think feel the same and are taking huge steps to move those sliders, not just for on-screen representation, but also in decision-making roles, key roles in the decision-making about the nature of the programming and the narratives and so on and so forth. Um, and if you look at, I don't know if I'm probably availability biased because I've got a seven-year-old, but if you look at children's television programming now and you compare it with children's television programming maybe 20 years ago, the shift in diversity is really, I think, really tangible and I think really positive because I think my daughter has grown up watching diverse representation. Um, so the short answer is I think that will be a huge strategic growth area for the producers of moving image content is what do you get if you dramatically improve your diversity behind and in front of the cameras? And we know because we're already discussing these things with the the makers of moving image work. Great, thanks. Uh, and uh, Mitchell has another question. Would you like to ask it, Mitchell? Hi again, Stephen. Um, I was just curious, how do you think the findings in this data set can be used to implement change? Yeah, we, we, we get asked this a lot and we talk about it a lot and it's quite I think it's quite complex and I think it's useful, resist, uh, it's useful to resist jumping to conclusions like, well, now we have a data set, the industry will change because we have a data set. Um, I think what the data set can achieve is a kind of benchmarking that we can use in discussions with stakeholders and industry and internally to drive our own thinking about how you push diversity and change. So it definitely has done that in the BFI. We talk a lot about um, what it means to have data that benchmarks. For example, if we come back to this data in five years and we learn that none of the BFI's initiatives for improving diversity um, in film production have shifted any of the opportunities for women, for example, at all. Imagine if the, the director of photography is worse for women um, in five years than it was when we launched. I think it gives you evidence or data driven evidence to say that anecdotally we may feel there's improvement, but the data may tell a different story. Now that doesn't mean that change will happen because of that. It just means you might have a you might have a more defensible benchmark to measure improvement against. So I am mean, hesitant about saying having data will change the you know working practices in the world. I mean it won't change it by itself, but at least you have a, a more defensible benchmark for when you're discussing progress and monitoring changes. At least you can say in 10 years, well, when we did this study, flawed though it was in 2017, here were the levels, um, and now here are the levels, and it's either plateaued or gone backwards. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a monitoring, it helps monitoring with a benchmark but it doesn't drive change on its own. I think it can just inform perhaps a better quality of a better quality of evidencing. Um, so data evidencing opposed to we think it was like this in 2017, but we're not certain. So yeah, I mean I hope that answers the question. I don't think it solves anything on its own, but I think it offers probably a, 
higher quality uh, benchmarking, data-driven benchmark. Although it has flaws, there's no doubt about it, but hopefully it's better than speculation. Great. Well, I think uh, that's just about all the time we have for questions today. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for your time today at uh, ODI Fridays and a special thanks to you, Stephen, uh, for your really, really great talk. Um, so we hope to see you all again at the, the next ODI Fridays. Uh, and until then, take care. Thanks a lot.